Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today our webinar. My name is Alec McCutcheon. I'm a director of Unicom and we're delighted to be hosting today's presentation, which is on the theme of a rigorous approach to DevOps, how we benchmark, measure and improve DevOps on continuous delivery maturity. I'm very pleased to advise our, our two presenters today who are Benjamin Wooten. Benjamin is the co-founder and principal consultant at a company called Sindachi, and he's presenting today with his colleague Richard Wadsworth, who's also a principal consultant. Uh, I know that both have deep experience in this area and uh, will also be available at the end of the, the presentation to answer questions. What we plan to do after the presentation, there'll be opportunity to type questions which uh, Benjamin and Richard will do their very best to, to answer. So without further ado, I will now hand over to our presenters. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Benjamin Wotton. Hi, I'm Rich Wadsworth here. Cool, uh, so we'll just kick off with a few words about DevOps. Um, I know it's been around for a long while now, but uh, there's still kind of a little bit of uh, confusion around exactly kind of what DevOps means. So I think uh, DevOps started from the kind of realization that historically kind of development and software uh, development and IT operations teams had been fairly kind of siloed places. Um, you know, with different ways of working, different skill sets, uh, different uh, kind of techniques for managing their work, etc. And DevOps kind of realized that if we kind of can improve the collaboration and uh, bring into line the ways of working across development and operations, then uh, speed of delivery uh, will increase. Um, DevOps was kind of an extension of agile software development. But whereas agile software development was very much focused on the kind of development and test uh, part of the equation, so we can get to kind of more frequent deployments into test environments, it didn't have an awful lot to say about improving deployments and improving the operability of software. So DevOps is about kind of improving that cycle time from uh, when a line of code is committed to when it's out running uh, in a production system. So what uh, what Sendashi are is we kind of aim to help uh, generally kind of large enterprise organizations adopt uh, the practices associated with DevOps. So that ranges from the kind of organizational considerations around how do I set up my team and what does it mean for the skills and the reporting lines within my organization uh, through to the kind of uh, you know the business processes around change management, release management and incident management and also kind of using the DevOps uh, associated tools. So these are things like Puppet, Chef, Docker, and leveraging kind of cloud infrastructure as a service again to uh, kind of speed up delivery cycle time. Um, so that's what we do. Um, we've worked with around 30 enterprise organizations in the UK um, over the last few years. And uh, I've recently merged with a company in Seattle to give us a US-based presence as well. So when we look at DevOps, DevOps today, uh, we realize that it still kind of faces adoption barriers within kind of an enterprise setting. If you want to do a DevOps transformation, it's a very kind of multifaceted thing where you, you're going from kind of soft cultural issues to uh, business process change right through to some of that kind of technical automation initiatives I touched on then. There's still a kind of lack of agreement of, uh, you know, what DevOps is and what good look like and how to do it. And I always felt that it kind of lacks a bit of a template for success. So when we started this, we looked at frameworks such as Scrum and ITIL. And that's, you know, they're not perfect, but it's a template which an enterprise can take and it will give them an idea of, you know, how to work, how to set up their teams, what skills they need. And we've been trying to kind of fill that gap at Sendaji um, by, you know, building the IP and working with clients to understand what good DevOps looks like. Central to that is we've always felt that the whole kind of DevOps maturity question needs more rigor. People often talk about it in kind of loose terms, such as saying, you know, DevOps is a culture. And again, there's not much kind of IP there around what good looks like. But I think we need a more kind of analytical, uh, methodical, scientific approach to improving DevOps maturity. So you imagine at the, at the start there, maybe somebody's kind of heard about DevOps, I think it's a good idea, and they're doing some research into it. But from that point, we need to be much more rigorous in how we move forward. The first question you might ask is, whereabouts are we on the maturity scale? And then you might wonder, where are we relative to other companies and our industry peers? 
and it helps at that point to have some kind of new you know numeric scale or some red amber green by which we can make those comparisons then you might want to say where do we start in our application portfolio so we want to understand kind of levels of readiness within our application suite and then there's a big question for a lot of companies in kind of 2016 is how do we build the business case to make this transformation again to kind of you know if you're asking for funding you need to be able to turn this into hard benefits hard efficiencies uh, return on investment etc and i think not having this thinking within devops has kind of held adoption back and it's something else we've been trying to improve uh, in our daily work and then moving forward say you've gone on to a proof of concept you want to be able to understand and articulate what were the benefits um, in terms of efficiencies and hard cost savings and then keep up that process as you kind of continue with your DevOps transformation to understand what return on investment am I getting, how is it improving my KPIs, what, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's just that word rigor kind of improves your prospects at, uh, of kind of being successful with DevOps transformation. Great, thanks Ben. Um, just before I, I'm just going to talk about um, different ways, different tools we have of helping companies you know, assess what their current maturity is and how, how they can put in baselines of measurement. Just before I do that, I just wanted to, to call out that um, if you have any questions that you wanted to ask us, then, um, then please do make use of the, of the facility on GoToMeeting. Um, we'll collate all the questions and then, then we'll answer them at the end, but you should see on that little side panel on go to meeting you can ask questions that way um, so yeah so so a, a key tenant of, of devops um, best practice if you like is being able to measure so any change to software we make any change to process we make um, we need to be able to to be able to not only qualitative qualitatively but quantitatively understand if that change had a, a positive or negative impact and to be able to do that we, we, we obviously need a means of measurement and we need a baseline so um, as part of our, uh, part of our immersion, a, a way that we, um, it's a tool that we have really to, to get to know customers, we, we have what, what we call the, the maturity assessment. And it's, it's essentially a, it's a set of 200, 200 plus DevOps data points um, that we've collected over the, the, the last 24 months that we use to understand and get to know the company. What, what we do in that phase, we really, we, we talk to as many people as we can um, from different business units across the company and from different roles within the company to really get an understanding of where the company is now and people's current concerns and also you know to, to separate um, symptoms that people are feeling from the actual root causes and understand the, the politics behind those root causes and also you know is it a, is it a technical root cause is it a, a people root cause or is it a um, is it a process based cause um, and we take a holistic view um, across all of DevOps you know it, the, the answer is really just a tooling solution the answer is really just a, a process tweak and, uh, and the answer is really just a change to um, you know to, to an operating model um, often we're, we're, we're asked into a company to you know to, to solve a very particular tooling problem for example but um, as you can imagine that there's no point in automating a process that, that's that's aligned to an out, out of date um, operating model so so we, we have to take a holistic view in everything we do um, something that sets, sets us apart really from from other companies is, is this idea it's a very lightweight assessment you know we, we spend you know anything from a couple of days to to maybe two weeks with, with a with a company but it's, re it's really longer than that so we're not talking about six months uh, I'm just going to try and move forward. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Ben. So, um, so yeah, so, so the assessment covers people, process, and technology, and we have, um, as you can imagine, we, we we've built up, a, you know, kind of an understanding of the areas that we need to focus on to improve um, de DevOps ac across the whole of the enterprise, not just not just within technology. So, a focus on people. So, really, so so what does good look like in a in a high performing, um, you know? team that have achieved um, DevOps maturity have, have, have reached that level of optimization really where they have that DevOps maturity so um, as you can imagine you know there, there's there's some um, there, there's there's some aspects that, that have been well discussed over the last three or four years things like uh, cross-functional teams you know where a, a team that shares the same incentive it can be a virtual team um, ideally co-located but, but the crux of this is the thing that makes it a team is that they have the same incentives 
and those might be delivery goals. Um, they're normally to, to be you know, really effective incentives. They're ideally the, rate, the same financial goals. Um, but certainly that, that aspect of a team, they have to have a shared incentive. Um, and that, that the skills that you'd expect to find in those teams, um, developers, you know, testers, test automation skills, um, as well as exploratory testing, operations engineers, um, release engineering skill, and also um, you know, capability to do, to do business analysis and, and turn those business requirements into technical requirements. Um, and also you know, just being really tightly integrated with the business. So as you can imagine, you know, we, we quite often see um, instances where developer-led um, transitions into Agile um, you know, running out of steam after maybe six months, the, the energy that the, the, the development and technology team have put into converting to Agile, everyone's running out of energy because ultimately, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a silo within a, within a waterfall process at the, at the business level. The business are still making demands on technology through waterfall processes. Um, and if it wasn't for the inordinate amount of energy that, that technology are putting into it, you know, the, the house of cards would come down. So absolutely, you know, we, we're looking at tightly integrated relationship with business, um, where you're aligned around, around product and, um, you know, and deadlines and understanding how the customer expects to receive new features. Um, and then process, so people process technology. Um, process, some, sometimes we can make small process changes and it has significant effect. Um, but really when we talk about process, we're talking about, um, the really positive aspects you can get out of continuous delivery. Um, so we're looking to move our um, our releases into to small batches of change, um, with really you know high significant degrees of collaboration between um, the business knowledge owners and the developers and the operation guys. So you know le leaning on um, leaning strongly on agile, you know high high degree of collaboration, um, and also. Automation in not only in uh, test automation, but you know, in in release and deployment, and also uh, automation in spinning up infrastructure, automation in spinning up um, monitoring applications and uh, environments is is a big one where we see you know this idea of environment log jam. So while the development team may be agile, you know the, the classic cases, the infrastructure team are not agile yet. Um, even though they think they might be, and it still takes six weeks, three months to get any kind of operating system resource, even even when we're talking about data center virtualization, you know, or even some cases where companies have moved to cloud, the amount of process and red tape in place still means it can take weeks to get um, get compute even at the public cloud level. And then finally, technology. If you get the people and process right, then the technology drops out. Um, we look at um, all aspects, you know, from test automation, release automation, um, companies' planned use of cloud. Um, we're, we're, we see uh, quite a lot of naive adoption of, of IaaS, you know, so companies move to the cloud without really understanding the implications on how the operating model needs to change. Um, how, does a, how does an enterprise adopt cloud and allow the colleagues and associates within that company to be good citizens? So how can we ensure that anyone who spins up some compute or some storage or elastic load balancer, whatever the cloud service is, how can we ensure that they're following you know, best practice of the enterprise and, and how can we make it as easy as possible to do that? And that's partly through process, that's partly through tooling. Companies are starting to look to cloud management platforms like Clicker um, and to put in that level of abstraction to enable people to, to, you know, to make the best use of cloud. And that might be public cloud, it might be private cloud as well. Um, we've got infrastructure monitoring, you know, tools, Terraform, Packer, um, the HashiCorp stack, we've got Chef, um, uh, all the usual suspects, you know, Ansible's obviously um, really gaining popularity with its latest release um, in the enterprise. They, they've made big, big inroads into the Windows stack and they've really hardened a lot of the modules on the, um, on the Linux stack as well. Um, so how do we, how do we execute the you know, the, the, the maturity assessment phase, we basically come on site and it's about getting to know the people, getting to know the processes. And we do that through workshop, we do that through um, technical deep dives, which might be, you know, getting in and looking at the code to understand, you know, the, the, the amount of complexity that's actually in the code. And also through pairing, 
we um, we operate a, a sort of team pairing model where this idea of a player player coach we believe it's an infinitely more valuable to to show you how to um, you know to, to show you how to bring in these ways of working and how show you how to use these ways of working rather than just deliver some product for you. So it's it's absolutely about knowledge sharing um, and and work workshop. Um, based discovery, you know, talking about um, lean principles, um, talking about technical architecture, talking about everything from, you know, how do you write a good unit test that's that's not fragile to if we put a monitoring system in for you, how are you going to actually make use of that data? You're going to be in, in, inundated with data from your monitoring system. What are you actually going to do with it? Um, and we've developed our own tooling around this and, and IP around this, as you can imagine. So we, we have um, a, a number of different um, sort of questionnaires that are automated that will help you reach your own level of maturity. And this is something that we, we um, often leave on site. So what we're doing in this assessment is really helping you baseline and understanding what your current maturity is. Um, and as time progresses, you can go back and, um, and see for yourself your own improvement using this tool. So um, at the end, what, what do you, would you expect to get at the end of this assessment? So it's really an understanding of, I think Ben touched on it before, so you'd be interesting to, to know where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, also where you are in relation to your peers, um, and also where you are in relation to, to the wider industry. So it's about bringing all of this qualitative and quantitative data together in a format that, that's easy to consume, um, but where we've set a, separated um, cause from effect, if you like, and um, and we played back a set of recommendations that are actually actionable. You know, it's, it's not much use in coming back to you and saying, right, you need to rewrite your system from scratch to, to be able to make any impact. That's not an actionable um, recommendation. Um, so, Ben, if you can just go back one slide a sec. Yeah, so we've got this, um, the, way, the way we present the data, you know, there, there's many different graphical forms, but this idea of comparing you with your peers across um, the nine key areas that, that we that we take an interest in. This particular graph, you know, the, the closer you are to the centre is, is a sign of lower lower maturity. And we use we go back over our catalogue of you know the, the, the different companies we've spoken to over the last two years, and we can give you a balanced view of where you fit. And and also that serves as a really good tool to help you prioritise where you need to spend your effort. And we can also, you know, depending on the size of your company and how many teams you've got, um, we can provide heat maps and, and different graphical forms that make it easy for you to consume about where the different levels of maturity are in your company. You know, if you can imagine, um, a lot of enterprises have grown through acquisition. Um, a lot of uh, enterprises have different geographical locations, um, different cultures, if it's different countries as well. And all of these um, different factors play into different levels of maturity. We quite often see wide degrees of variance from team to team. Some teams might be absolutely flying, and some teams might still be struggling to write unit tests. Cool. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Richard. So I think the point of all of that is we wanted to take a fairly kind of nebulous, loose concept around DevOps and make it much more kind of rigorous and analytical and put real numbers behind that. Sometimes you can argue about those numbers and maybe sometimes the judgments are a little bit subjective, but I think what we've been successful in doing is just adding kind of, you know, much more rigor scientific approach to a kind of benchmarking and improving DevOps maturity. So I'd be interested in your feedback um, on that, uh, actually, on this approach. I think out of that kind of uh, benchmarking, discovery, maturity exercise, the next thing we typically develop is a DevOps strategy. Now this is essentially a set of work streams for uh, raising maturity across people, process and technology. So that might be initiatives like change of process, maybe a small kind of restructure or kind of a, a proof of concept of working in a cross-functional team or adoption of certain tools to kind of improve your level of automation and improve your DevOps maturity. So we want that kind of assessment process to be really kind of actionable at the back end, you know, lots of kind of a detailed program which you could take and then implement within your own organization. The next question that often comes up is, once we've got that plan, is how do we build a business case? Because at that point, maybe, you know, you have to bring new skills into the team or you have to buy new tools or you need training or maybe even some consultancy support. 
Um, and the process we go through there is we take the kind of outputs from a maturity assessment and we play that through a kind of bank of DevOps efficiencies that we have. So for instance, we'll say, you know, if you change to branching your code uh, in this way, you can potentially lock in a 5% increase in your efficiency. Because you're kind of halfway on the maturity level, you know, you've potentially still got 2.5% uh, efficiency increase to play for. We'll then play that kind of efficiency model back over your previous projects. So maybe we'll look at the projects you delivered last year and understand the kind of money you could have saved if you'd adopted the practices we are proposing. And in this case, uh, these were real numbers behind this, we came up with a business case of uh, £400,000 saving per year by implementing uh, these 10 to 15 kind of technology initiatives. And that's a kind of pretty like typical uh, business case we'd see. And I think this really helps because I speak to a lot of people who they want to do DevOps and it's kind of intuitively a better way of doing things and better way of working, but they do have struggle articulating their business case. And we've had a lot of experience of kind of just, again, applying rigor to that process and taking a kind of soft topic and making it scientific. I think over time we, we, we do then want to look at improving DevOps maturity. So taking people through these kind of scales from low maturity to high maturity. Quite a few people develop these kind of five point scales, but I've always felt that was a bit of a kind of shortfall. You know, it's not good enough because DevOps is so multifaceted. You can be strong in one area and weak in another area. So we've developed around 20 different maturity scales, you know, looking at things such as lean maturity, agile maturity, level of deployment automation, uh, level, you know, kind of DevOps maturity of architecture. And that enables us to build this kind of multi-dimensional view of kind of where you are on these different axes. Um, and this can be good because it's another tool we can use to show kind of improvements of maturity over time. I then wanted to talk about some of the kind of initi initiatives we put into the place on this kind of improving maturity journey. And as Richard mentioned earlier, kind of one of the most effective ways to do this is to m move towards more cross-functional teams. So a lot of kind of companies that have done agile have in a situation on the left where we've got developers and testers working together on the same team, uh, maybe deploying code every two weeks into a test environment. I think to do DevOps, we want to start bringing some of those operational skills such as sysadmins, DBAs and middleware engineers into the mix as well. So the team are more kind of uh, fully able to deploy and run, run their own code. Um, this is what people like Netflix call the kind of you build it, you run it model. It can be difficult because it's a kind of an organizational restructure which might have kind of costs and reporting line implications. but we can sometimes get around that with, you know, virtual teams, for instance, where the DBA stays as part of a DBA team, but he's fully aligned into a kind of cross-functional team. So this can be a really powerful uh, way of just improving maturity, you know, sitting people together, same team, working on the same things with the same incentives. At enough scale, we often work with clients to implement DevOps teams. Now, this is a set of people who are responsible for your development tooling and your deployment and your path to production. And over the years, we've learned a lot about how to be successful with DevOps teams, kind of avoiding that problem where you're kind of too centralized in a silo or where you're kind of too distributed and everybody's solving things in a different way and duplicating effort. So we kind of encourage the DevOps teams we work with to be more about kind of enablement and coaching and training and helping the kind of delivery teams on board onto the platform and be successful in using it, using kind of self-service tools. After looking uh, the kind of people issues um, of which cross-functional teams is one, but there's also all stuff around kind of cultural indicators and reporting lines and uh, empowerment and stuff like that. That was just an example. With that kind of a processes which are in use. So here we modeled a kind of incident, so it was a production incident, and the aim was to demonstrate all of the kind of hand lookovers and problems in this kind of situation where developers are handing to testers, who are handing to operations teams, who are handing over to infrastructure teams. And the detail is probably not important, but we just kind of articulated all of these problems where people, you know, they didn't have the skills um, to kind of uh, manage the incoming work, where they weren't communicating and collaborating, collaborating effectively, where they didn't have an understanding of the change uh, they were being asked to evaluate or implement. 
and also this kind of situation where developers had gone in and uh, because the process was going so badly, developers had gone in and just made the change out of hours, bypassing process, and then that was kind of rolled back on the next release. So this is a kind of, you know, it was a real example of a kind of non-DevOps, non-lean process and all of the problems uh, this created for this particular organization, uh, which was a bank. We then kind of modeled the process um, as it would have looked in a more kind of DevOps mature environment, as I just outlined with those cross-functional teams. Now, in this situation, the team are kind of fully empowered to do everything they need to do to deploy and support the system. And they also have a kind of knowledge and the skills and responsibility to do so. In that situation, we have kind of fewer handovers. We have kind of less scope for error and misunderstanding. Um, we have kind of less calendar time elapsed from uh, you know, when the incident was realized to when it was resolved. Um, you have kind of less people stepping outside of a software development life cycle, uh, so quality is improved as well as the kind of speed. So typically on a DevOps transformation, we do a whole bunch of these kind of process improvements, um, you know, quite kind of iterative and incremental and try to keep them as non-disruptive as possible. But over time, we want to move the organization to be kind of leaner, faster, and build quality into a process. So then moving on to technology. So we'll typically have, out of a DevOps maturity assessment, a number of technical initiatives um, around kind of automation generally. So automating kind of releases, automating infrastructure, automating testing. The most common problem we see is what we call internally the environment logjam. And this is a problem where teams can't get access to enough environments at the right time. So even though they may have lots of environments, um, you have to wait to get access to that environment. And maybe projects overrun, so your own project is impacted because you can't get into that environment. Once you're in the environment, they're often inconsistent between development, test, and production, which creates kind of a lot of problems and a lot of production incidents because we're testing in non-production realistic environments. Now we work with a lot of companies to kind of solve this environment logjam and that often involves kind of moving on to a more modern virtualization platform, so maybe a private cloud such as OpenStack, adopting public cloud for the first time, so AWS or Azure, and then leveraging a tool such as Chef to kind of get all of the configuration into code and be able to procure environments on demand at the click of a button. This can be a massive enabler for development teams who are generally, uh, amongst our client base at least, kind of screaming out for more infrastructure earlier, more control over infrastructure. Another kind of set of techno technology initiatives we often put into place are kind of CI, CD. So this is like automating the builds of code, so we have earlier feedback and automating the kind of testing, so integrating stuff like security testing, performance testing, regression testing into that continuous integration automated process. And then continuous delivery, which is around taking the kind of application components and pushing them from dev to test to prod uh, kind of much more frequently with much less ceremony. So we do a lot of work in this area. I think this continuous delivery is the ultimate game. What we want to do is break down that kind of release mindset of kind of big bulky releases, which we only do every six months and they're really big and risky and scary and move towards kind of smaller batches of change, but delivered more often. There's a book that uh, was released uh, a few years ago now, which describes this process of kind of using automation and what this means for your way of working. And we help a lot of people kind of achieve this vision and be able to kind of go faster and innovate more off the back of it. Then, just to say, so we're putting all of these initiatives into place, um, you know, process change, organizational changes, uh, automation initiatives. It's important to continue to benchmark and demonstrate mature, improving maturity over time. So here, um, it's anonymized data, but it's real data. We looked at DevOps maturity over a, kind of a one-year engagement with us across three teams and showed how that was increasing. Obviously, some teams kind of making uh, more progress than others. Um, but it's interesting, uh, interesting exercise. Importantly, we also want to kind of track and monitor and benchmark the metrics which we care about. So, you know, not just IT-focused stuff, but how how is DevOps driving through to improve customer experience, to kind of earlier delivery of value, um, 
to kind of increase customer satisfaction. And then the kind of IT type KPIs, such as uh, number of failed deployments, uh, mean time to recovery, uh, capturing and showing and demonstrating the kind of benefits of, of all of this transformation. Come back to Rich for a case study. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so uh, a, a question we often get is, you know, what are the type of clients you're working with? Who are you working with? So we work with um, we work with customers of all, all shapes and sizes, from from the large banks who have, you know, 15, 15 20,000 people in technology, down to uh, you know startups who might have offshored their their development capability, and that and that might be two people, you know, in um, you know, in in the uh, in Eastern Europe, for example. So um, we we thought we'd share a, um, a a case study with you, just so you can get a feel for um, for, the, for the kind of things that we find and the, the kind of recommendations that we um, the, the kind of recommendations that we make. So um, this, this particular case study, um, global publishing organisation, um, hundred year heritage, um, global brands, um, web products mostly um, and 5,000 employees um, you know, dis distributed around the world so so a significant enterprise um, significant amount of legacy that's legacy applications legacy infrastructure um, legacy ways of working and, and, and legacy ways of thinking um, they were really trying to work out how to make the most out of uh, our cloud resource so um, there has been a corporate mandate to move to Amazon Web Services, um, so that really involved moving um, resources out of their data center into AWS. And how could they do that? How can they keep the lights on in their legacy? Um, and how can they, while they're learning how to be a good citizen and learning the different paradigm shift of architecting for the cloud and operating in the cloud, and learning how to make use of, of all the, the rich services that Amazon offer, how can they? Um, continue to innovate and, and improve their rate of innovation to, to remain competitive. Um, there, there, are, there are a number of issues, you know, we, we ran our assessment um, and surfaced a number of issues. Um, significantly because of their, their distribution, um, there were significant silos across technology, so not just silos across the business, but silos across technology as well. Um, mentioned this problem before where you have, um, um, quite, quite often see a, a significant variation in the ability of, of the technology team, and that may be because of um, you know uh, where where they're based in the world. Um, if the team has been um, brought into the company through acquisition, so you have some teams you know that are literally still um, struggling with the, the concept of unit testing. Maybe maybe it's a, a knowledge thing. It might be based on the technology. You know, maybe it's mainframe and technology issues where where unit testing is very difficult. Um, to, to some teams that are, are really quite um, mature in their processes but struggling to, to move to the next level. Um, and also um, this particular company was struggling with the concept of centralization versus decentralization. So they recognized that the centralized model of the 90s and noughties was, was holding them back in terms of innovation. Um, but at the same time, there was fear around how do they um, devolve some of those responsibilities out. Um, and also a, a general lack of visibility of, of future workload. There, there was um, there was too much work, too much unplanned work, um, and work coming in from too many different channels. So you know the, the, the classic case of people door stopping at, at people's desks to get things done, versus um, executives changing their mind halfway through sprints. Um, you know all, all the classic different sort of, uh, side channels that you, you can imagine would happen in an enterprise. They were there. So, um, so after after spending time with with the team and, and spending time in different offices globally and, and in, uh, within different countries, uh, making sense of um, what's a symptom versus um, a root cause versus um, a historical problem that I'm that, you know that we're just being told about because it's interesting um, and, and a problem that has has yet to be solved, or indeed um, identifying potential problems that, that no one else has recognised yet. Um, so after processing all that information, the, the, the recommendations that, that we really came back with were all around um, to continue 
to allow the company to innovate. You know, very clever people working in this company. So really, we need to capitalise on the, the the passion and the pragmatism that, that existed within the company, but allow them to operate in a in an enterprise in a, in a way that that's um, you know that, that's fit for the enterprise. And really, the the federated um, operating model is something we recognise. So. So what's federation? So you've got this idea of centralization where, where all decisions are made by a central body. Um, and the other end of the scale of that is, is total decentralization where all um, decisions are made in isolation. Um, the middle ground is, is a federated model. Um, and the, the trick with federation is to work out um, what decisions should remain um, central and, and what decisions should be devolved out into localized teams. And that, that decision is different from company to company. There is no template for that. But so the skill there is working out how much should be centralized and how much should be federated out. So um, this is talking about federating out people. So you know, federating out skill sets um, and also federating out process and policy as well. Um, in addition to that, um, we recognized that there was a, um, a place for uh, the site reliability engineering capability. Um, if you've not heard of that, that was born out of um, out of Google. It's, uh, it's if you like, it's an ops team on steroids, and uh, the, the role of SRE is to continually push the boundaries of the platform um, in production to understand where its scale ceilings are, to understand where problems are really before they happen, um, and also to embed um, processes, you know, to enable releases to to come out quickly. teams no longer have to wait on centralized decisions and, um, and those decisions to sit in people's queues you know they're empowered to make those decisions themselves you know they're, they're, they're accountable for those decisions but they're able to make those decisions and, and act on them um, and also to, to work with um, Sundachi and engineers to bring in best practices um, through um, product delivery so for, for us to become um, you know to, to, to pair up and actually become part of the the agile teams and um, you know actually deliver deliver a product with the client um, and and show the answer possible through bringing in best practice and and that allowed them to continue to increase you know their Um, yeah, so we're really we're talking about um, DevOps. Um, you know, people say, is are people really adopting DevOps? And, and, and the answer is an, an absolute yes. You know, as I say, we, we're talking to um, companies of all shapes and sizes from different industries, um, and the momentum's only building. You know, the, the tooling is really changing the landscape. You see a, a move into containerization, um, adoption of microservices. These are all different things that are enabling companies to move faster. But at its at its roots, I think it's um, it's improving your, your overall continuous delivery capability is the thing that is going to enable you to, to reach that optimization, that, that DevOps optimization. And so, um, um, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so yeah, that brings us to the end of the main content. Um, so we actually have a maturity assessment uh, brochure which describes uh, this kind of process. Uh, if you don't have any questions, then do kind of email us or reach, reach out to us over the website. Um, happy to share this document and our kind of further experiences in uh, kind of doing mature benchmarking, measuring, and improving DevOps maturity and discussing some of those case studies. Uh, and in your industry now, so please, please do let us know. And that brings us on to questions. So thank you. Uh, Rich, do you want to read the questions? I don't.
갑질은. So I know uh, one question we had, had earlier. Somebody was asking us uh, what are the kind of um, the banana skins in a DevOps transformation? What are the difficulties and where do people struggle? And I think it tends to be when you get to the people and process stuff. So a kind of restructure, for instance, um, it's very kind of big. It's quite disruptive if we're changing reporting lines and budgets and financial models and stuff like that. So that can be the harder stuff to achieve, but Sadly, that's also the stuff which delivers the most benefit. So that can be a challenge, but what I say is try and bring some of those considerations forward. You know, have the conversations early about you know what if we can get people working in an integrated team? What if we can change some of these kind of long established business processes which kind of causes pain and uh, inefficiency? Um, so that's definitely one sort of banana skin and challenge we come across quite a lot with our clients. Uh, there was a second question, which is, what kind of industries do we see um, adopting DevOps and continuous delivery? Um, I think we kind of saw it in three waves. So the first uh, first wave we saw was in media. So we just covered a media case study. But a lot of the kind of online newspapers and stuff, uh, they were moving from offline to online. They needed to radically improve how they Deliver. Of our kind of early conversations and discussions and customers were in the kind of media industry. Last year we did an increasing amount of work in retail. So these were companies who were finding all of their growth opportunities were kind of online and mobile. And they were uh, moving uh, to kind of improve how they deliver software um, to kind of uh, continue to meet what their customers were asking for. This year, I think the story for us has been financial services and insurance. So increasingly, they are feeling kind of disrupted and looking for you know very kind of radical new ways uh, to uh, you know radical new ways of working, of you know kind of re-architecting and re-platforming. Um, so it really feels like it's crossing over into the big one, which is kind of financial services. So any more? Uh, there's a question here around what are the benefits of Chef and configuration management. Now, the big problem that we see is, you know, people are getting more and more infrastructure. If you're moving on to kind of private cloud or public cloud, um, the old kind of ways of managing that infrastructure don't really scale. If you had old kind of sysadmins who have to kind of go into boxes and run uh, kind of configuration changes, so. What a tool like Chef enables you to do is kind of automate that kind of configuration management and infrastructure automation. And when you kind of bring all of that stuff under automation, you bring it into your software development lifecycle. So you can only kind of change that in one place, which is through your source control management system. You can then maybe test those infrastructure changes and have kind of Chef push those infrastructure changes out on to, uh, into your environment. Big benefit of that is all of your environment and servers become very consistent, um, and a consistent path to production is a massive advantage uh, if we want to do sort of production-like testing uh, in development, test, and production environments. So, uh, definitely recommend people adopt an infrastructure automation tool to uh, be successful with that. Uh, 